everybody. Um, my name is Caroline, and I'm here today to learn just as much as you are. I want to learn about books that are published in countries that are very much underrepresented in the UK f translation field. Um, I and I'd like us first to hear about some of these books, and then we'll talk about the challenges that the publishers face in getting them translated. Um, I work for Walker Books, which is an independent children's only publisher. And I reckon that in the last 20 years, we've probably published 15 books in translation, absolutely tops, possibly fewer. Um, they are, I'm very, very proud of them, but they are mostly from Western Europe. So from France, um, let's think Norway, Holland, Italy. I think that's really the limit um, of as far as we've gone. Um, if I think back to my own childhood, books in translation were a huge part of it, from Baba and Madeleine to Emile and the Detectives, Heidi, um, I Am David. I don't know if how many people these books will mean something to, but um, the Moomins, Tintin, Asterix, these were my life. And um, if you broaden the, the sort of notion of translation further and think about Greek myths and stories from Grimm and Perrault and Hans Christian Andersen, we, we would have none of those stories if it were not for translation. And they are such a huge part of our culture and the culture of all children, I would argue, in the UK. Um, we have a panel of people um, from very different places. Um, Shireen is from the Lebanon. Susan is working books to do with Central and Eastern Europe and Melike from Turkey. And I'm going to ask each of them to speak for about five minutes about the books they publish and what they think those books have to offer. And then we'll talk about other things. So shall we start with um, yeah. Shireen? Yeah. My, uh, hi, uh, I'm Shireen. I'm from Lebanon. I publish children's books in Arabic. Um, you know the Arab word shares one language, which is Arabic, by 320 million. So supposedly it's a big market uh, for us, but it's not. And I've been publishing for the past 14 years. And um, I've done my master's in children's literature in the UK, and I'm doing research and uh, publishing in Oxford Books and also UK. So I have a bit of an experience from the UK and from Lebanon and the Arab, Arab world. Um, they asked us to say why we think our books are great. Yeah, they are <laughs> for me. They're, they're very nice. And um, I think the Arab world is, um, is different. And it, it, there's always a stereotype about the, the Arabs and camels and deserts and stuff like that. Um, maybe some of the books might show that we have a lot of common things and the Arab world is a big, is a big place and it, it's a bit different from every country. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my books and then we can start the discussion later. Uh, I chose five books because I thought they are recent and they are like a selection of different uh, styles. This one is about a princess. Uh, and every day she likes to dress up in a, different, uh, in a different princess and she imagines herself as a character. And then at the end, her mom makes her a special dress, which is her, she, she, it's her dress. It's Amina's dress. So it's, it's more like girly princessy book. This one is about a rabbit who likes to, uh, who tricks the other animals that if they give him gold coins, he will plant them for them. And then they will get more coins the next year. So it's how he tricks the other animals, and he tells them, oh, you have to wait one more season, stuff like that. But the turtle stares them to be the intelligent one. And yeah, this book is, um, is about a girl during the Lebanese war. You know, during the war, we used to stay underground uh, uh, in shelters, and how the, chil uh, and how, how the parents go and, and look for bread and stand in line and the bombing and the experience. But on the other side, there's that part of it where the children try to find the fun out of it. I've, I've lived the war, so I know this, this, this really is part of my life. Uh, the children used to put the candles and do the shadows and play shadow games in the shelter because I think that was 
one of the very few things that you can do when, when, it's, when, when there's a war. So it's putting a highlight about how a child might feel when there's a war. This one is about a crocodile and uh, uh, two crocodiles and a bird who was trying to protect the river area and having a deal with the other animals and then, you know, things mess up and the crocodiles want to attack, so it's like action. <laughs> <laughs> and this is about a girl who has a very nice red new uh, skirt and then she buys a chocolate and she forgets in the pocket and, you know, it melts. And then she tries to think how she's going to solve it. So she put it in the fridge, it didn't work. And, and at the end, she put it in the washing machine and she messed up all the, uh, the other white clothes. So her dad ends up with a pink uh, pyjama. And <laughs> there's more into it. So I'll keep uh, some time for my friends. Thank you. From Istros Books, and uh, oh, that's better, isn't it? Uh, from Istros Books, and uh, we publish books uh, in translation from Southeast Europe, uh, the Balkan region. Um, Istros is a fairly new company; been going just for over about, about over about a year. And so, I only have one children's book at the moment, which I'll tell you about. Um, we plan to publish around four to five titles a year, and one of those, uh, hopefully, will be a children's book. That's um, partly because I uh, come to publishing from a background in teaching, so I still have an interest in uh, children's literature, and partly because I think that, uh, well, literature and translation is anyway a niche in the UK market, but uh, children's literature and translation is a niche within a niche, so it's, a, it's another little battle to fight in. Uh, so um, that's why I'd like to do children's literature and translation, and the book I have to present to you is Hedgehog's Home. This book comes um, from a Yugoslav writer, Branko Čopić, who is much known and loved in all the former republics of Yugoslavia, but um, has, was never translated into English. So this is the first uh, English translation of his work, I believe. And it's, um, the interesting thing about the story is that it's in rhyme. And uh, so it's a rhyming uh, story about a very proud hedgehog you might have thought of hedgehogs as rather sweet characters, but not in this story. He's a, he's a defender of his home. He's a warrior. He's a hunter. So he, um, he, um, he's introduced in the story, and he is invited to dinner with uh, Mrs. Fox. I think there's a picture of him on the next one. There he is. He dresses up to go to dinner with his bow tie and everything. But um, Mrs. Fox, she has designs on him, you see. So she asks him to stay the night, and, uh, but he refuses most adamantly and, um, and then marches off, you see. And all this is done in this wonderful rhyme that keeps the story going, you see. And then uh, what happens in the end is that he meets, the fox follows him to find out what's so special about this home. And um, when, uh, when on the way, she meets various other animals, the bear, the, the wolf, the, the boar, who's rolling in mud. And uh, they all have their own verses. And uh, they all say, oh, home, who cares about home? You know, food's the most important thing. I'll, I'll give my home up for anyone. So at the end, you have this great speech by Hedgemond, the main character, where he says that it doesn't matter how humble your home is, that it's still your home and you should look after it. So... Although this is a story from uh, Southeast Europe, it's, I think everybody in the world has this feeling about their home. So it's a very international uh, moral. And, um, and that's the first book in, I hope, uh, a line of children's book that Istos will be publishing. Thank you very much. Melike? Hey, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to offer a few remarks for Turkish children's market. Uh, firstly, I want to give you some small inf uh, information about uh, Turkish uh, children's books market because Alexander asked me the proposal of the translated uh, books. Uh, maybe at the first slide you can see how many titles. Last year, uh, uh, the data of uh, ISBN and the new titles of the children's books and uh, uh, you can see 6,345 new titles and 1,815 published children's books are translated books. Next slide please. You can see the proportions. 
uh, English the first one, and then French, Spanish, German, Italian, and Swedish. You can see. And uh, yeah, this is the first titles that I want to give some information. Uh, this is my own stories. I'm a publisher, also I'm a writer, children's book writer, and also I study on uh, children's literature academically. Uh, I wrote this book with my colleague Reza Hematrat. Uh, Reza Hematrat, an Iranian artist. Uh, he illustrated these titles. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And uh, for the next four slides, you can see some uh, picture, some pages from this series. Uh, the Adventures of the Ravens uh, is six titles. It is intended to help develop a sense of individuality in children. Uh, the series has been translated into Bulgarian, German, and Chinese. Also, this year, the rights have been sold to Romania, Lebanon, and Russia. And we are just waiting to sign the agreements with Denmark and Slovenia. Uh, pilot team figures uh, in the stories, I think, are uh, universal. The in the adventures of the Ravens, there are stories which affect children's personality development in a positive way. Uh, by the age of four, you know, the character of a child is usually formed. Uh, for this reason, in the series, the main theme is that one exists as individual in society. When the stories are analyzed, it can be seen that figures try to internalize and identify their own existence through their own appearance and body. Uh, while they explore their identity in the society they belong to, the little ravens discover their own talents and creativity. Ravens were not chosen by chance. They are taught to be ugly birds. Uh, but in the stories, we realize that they are so sweet and produce goodness. Through the style and content, the stories are allow children to realize their own beauty and abilities. The beauty is in us, in our personalities, not elsewhere. The Raven stories are illustrated with the fingerprint technique. Each, finger, each fingerprint is peculiar to one and emphasizes the individual. And uh, yeah, by using the fingerprint technique, children connect with directly the artist. Children relate to the stories through these simple techniques and designs and want to express themselves using this technique. As they put signature to each painting, they gain self-confidence. Both the visual elements and the story form a wholeness, so the work reaches an aesthetic unity as graphic design, and the series presents a good example of reflecting feelings by simple design and plain expression. And uh, uh, yeah, this is the activity book of the series show how to draw by fingerprint technique. It helps children to find that there are many things to draw from the simplest to the most complex, and this allows them to create a magic world for themselves. Next yes, one. this is the first title. Oh my god, sorry. Okay. Going uh, backwards. There going we are. On? Is this good? This one? Yeah. Next one? Uh, this is okay. 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 Okay, so I have three titles uh, also. <laughs> so, uh, in a hurry, yeah, okay. Uh, the second one is about a classical Turkish Anatolian taste. Let's, let's go, yeah. And it is written by me also. And uh, it is now being illustrated by Buket Gencer. This story is, uh, it's a it will be a collection of tales told in a modern language using modern stations by, uh, from uh, classical Turkish Anatolian tales. Okay, yeah. and uh, this is a very interesting book uh, from uh, Tulin Kozikoğlu, written by Tulin Kozikoğlu and illustrated by Deniz Üçbaşaran. Uh, it is a, uh, in that book, uh, it is addresses growing up and resolving the Oedipus complex while maintained, maintaining a healthy bond between mother and son. Okay, next one. Yes, Perfect. very interesting book. Yes, okay. N yes, the last book uh, is Another Mom. It is also, I think, an uh, unusual book. Uh, the mother of the main character is different from the other mothers. Her clothes, behavior, and speech are not like other mothers at all. Do you think that a little girl really wants her mom to be like the other moms? Uh, the illustration technique of the books is unusual. Next slide, please. 
the Illustrate used use textiles with pastel and acrylic colors and different objects like buttons and tape measure to create a collage. This technique increases the appeal of the illustrations and gives three-dimensional effects to the readers. Yes, this is the, uh, these are the books, but I want to give a small uh, explanation of the TEDA project, that uh, governmental supplementary uh, project. Uh, if I have time, one or more one minute, I want to give some information about TEDA. The next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, TEDA, which is essentially a translation and publication subvention project, uh, was released in uh, 2005 for the wider dissemination of Turkish cultural through the translation and publication of Turkish cultural, artistic and literary works outside of Turkey by the Ministry of Culture. The Ministry provides subventions to international institutes, enterprises, these companies, foundations, and publishing firms which will publish such books. Since the beginning of the project, the publishers from 50 countries have been given support for the translation and publication of 985 works, both the number of works being granted subvention and their success reveal the significance of TEDA's role in the dissemination of Turkish written heritage throughout the world. You can find more information on the website www.tedaproject.com. Thank you. Thank you for thank your attention. You, um, thank you, Thank you, Melike. Is that it? Um, the next uh, thing I think we should do is ask each of our panelists to talk a little bit about their experience of trying and succeeding, I hope, to have books published in the UK. Um, in their market generally, what were the problems they encountered and um, the challenges? And should we just see what you've each got to say about that? Um, yeah. Actually, uh, we haven't been uh, we haven't been successful in translating any of our books into English. Uh, we've translated some of them into other languages, but there are always some changes that uh, the publishers do. Um, it's very hard to reach a UK publisher. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's easy, you can easily access the rights person who would buy the rights or the editor in, in any UK publishing house. And if you do, there are very specific things and the language is, like the Arabic is not a very common language, so I think it's one of the main obstacles that might stand in our way. So um, I think just going there is very hard. And even when you're in a, an international book fair like Frankfurt, Bologna, London, uh, through a ministry stand or, or a common stand, uh, you're rarely approached by an English publisher who wants to look at the books or, or know the story or listen to you. And then when we travel to a book fair, we, have, we listen to a lot of stories in every meeting, like half an hour of on and on stories about the UK publishers and the story of this and the story of that. And, and we, we translate more, so it's, it's one way Very thing. polite. Yeah. <laughs> Which countries have you had your books translated into? Uh, we've had it, uh, we've, we had a book about war. It has been translated to several European and, and uh, other languages. Um, but the, the, um, it was done through a Belgian publisher and the illustrations were, were changed because, you know, the, the idea of changing a book and, and how they see things from another perspective. That's interesting, yes. Um, what about you, Susan? Well, um, before I set up Istos Books, I had already translated this book. So I did have some experience of trying to find uh, publishers for it. And <coughs> I didn't quite know, I kept changing my mind about what track to take because first of all, I wrote to publishers saying, oh, this is a story much loved in Yugoslavia and it, uh, you know, it's on the school curriculum in Croatia and, and things like that. And, and then I got a very negative response. I see someone shaking their head like, it wasn't a good idea. Um, and I thought, oh, right, well, maybe that's not good because they're going to think, oh, that's very obscure. You know, we don't want a book from Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore, etc., etc. all the problems to do with that. And so then I thought, oh, right, well, I'm not even going to say where it's from. I'm just going to send it as a story. You know, this is a lovely story written in rhyme about a hedgehog and, yeah, charming, etc. Again, I didn't really get anywhere with that. And I think partly because of what you said, of not really knowing who to target, perhaps. And, um, and also, uh, it was the same situation when I tried to get the rights because I also translated this book. So 
I think that the people I asked for the rights, I got a, a reply of something like, who are you? Or something, you know, <laughs> because I was just the translator. So, um, but once, obviously, I'd formed my own publishing house, that was a completely different story. I got the rights very quickly. But for me, um, this book uh, is... People who are from that region or who know that region are very keen to try this book and to buy it and read it and give it to their kids. But I haven't really managed to break through to, let's say, the common English audience where someone has nothing to do with this area or no knowledge of it and just takes it as a story. So um, that's something perhaps we can talk about later. Maybe. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, European market is very difficult for us to sell rights. Uh, I know many European countries, uh, especially German, uh, prefer take rights uh, only for publish bilingual publishing for Turkish children. They not prefer Turkish books for German uh, children or Denmark children or French children. They prefer to take rights uh, only for Turkish children uh, to to teach Turkish very well uh, that live in that countries. So uh, especially, uh, uh, I, have, I have been attending these fairs nearly for five years, and uh, I didn't have any appointment with in England uh, publishers. It's impossible for me, uh, but it is easy, uh, a bit easy uh, with other countries, uh, other European countries, but uh, English uh, United Kingdom uh, publishers, it's impossible. When I offer, uh, they say we only publish on our books or bestseller uh, from the other uh, European countries. Yeah. So uh, I'm so happy to be here <laughs> uh, to, to show our titles, our lovely books. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I'm not, um, Turkish is a big market, very big market, because uh, from the age uh, 1 to 18, there are nearly 18 million children in Turkey. And uh, the main uh, market is the schools. Uh, and the books uh, especially consumed in the schools by the, by the teacher. Uh, so the teacher prefers uh, especially the suitable books that are suitable to the curriculums. So artistic books and uh, sometimes bestsellers are not so suitable for general uh, markets in Turkey. So uh, we publish English titles, French titles, German titles, uh, translate to Turkish, but their amount is not so high. Uh, they are not bestsellers. The bestsellers in Turkey produced uh, by Turkish publishers and uh, we sell directly to the schools. I think they've all raised um, many of the crucial reasons why it's very hard to break into the UK market. I mean, one of the things Shireen said about seeing the right person, a, a right person is not going to be the right person because a right person is trying to sell. So the rights people on the Walker stand are here to sell our books, and it's hugely important for them. They're not here to buy. So there's something we could be doing perhaps to foster links between editors, the people who could buy books, um, and other publishers that but, we're not doing now. But the question is that, do they want to buy books? Because the UK market is, UK publishing is very saturated, like, there's so many books and it's very quick and the cycle is very quick and, and I've, I've stayed for some time in Egmont when I was doing my masters and the amount of manuscripts that the editor receives is, is really amazing, you know, like the piles and piles of mail and, and people trying and writing so, so having to, to, to read everything and then maybe considering something else, you know, it's I think that they don't have time, they have limited, I don't know, the, thing, the titles that they have to cover and the ideas, so it's, it's very competitive. And even in the UK, you cover ideas that are from other markets, like, f for example, Francis Lincoln, they're doing books about uh, Mecca, about Ramadan, about the, the, like the Islamic topics, about uh, children from Africa, about, you know, it's, 
you the market is is covering a lot of ideas and it's very the, the, the way to go in is very small you know and yes. it's very hard to know how to do it and where and to convince somebody why they have to do it so and i think melike is right to talk about the educational market in each country being um, homegrown we, we aren't going to want to buy educational books in because we're making our own that are related to our curriculum. So the books we are looking for would be the special books. They really would. They would be books either because they had beautiful art or stories that told us things that we don't you know, have access to here or said things in an interesting and different way. So I think that's another, another reason for the... The difficulty. I think there are lots of reasons. Uh, I want to ask some one question. In Turkey, generally, the main consumer, the main uh, uh, consumer is the teachers and the parents, not children. Uh, in my country, uh, what about England? Uh, what about the children can choose their own books, or parents or teachers guide them? Well, um, it's probably the same. Uh, books are mainly bought by parents for children and by teachers for children. So we all wrestle with that problem of uh, not having direct access to our readers. And we have to you know, make the books look so enticing that children will pester their parents or their teachers to read them. So it's a very similar problem in the same countries. We have obviously... A, a big and rich tradition of children's books going back a long, long way. So we are a market with a lot of history, yeah. which arguably makes us slightly less open. But what I was trying to say in my introduction was I think we so badly need to be open to other markets, and we are the poorer for not being. But I, as a publisher, I, I couldn't agree more that it's very, very difficult for you all. Um, and interesting that you've said that English books are very heavily translated in Turkey. Would this be true of, would you know about the Middle East? Um, sorry, the Balkans. Balkans the yes. Balkans. Yeah, I think that's also the case. I certainly know that the ubiquitous Gruffalo is all over the Croatian bookstores. So, uh, yeah, I think it's the case. That Although they have their own as well, quite an active industry. I think probably 30% or something comes from... And, and what sort of children's books are they? In, in well, the I was going to mention Montenegro that, actually, because you were saying that um, you try to make your children's books look enticing as possible so the parents will buy it or the children will draw, be drawn to it. And I think it's much easier, in a way, to, to uh, sell an illustrated book or a, a young yes. children's book than it is for older children's book, which is a whole, probably another area. But the fact that you've got a beautiful illustration on the front, in fact, the illustrations, the pictures are the things that go across the borders, aren't they? And without you even knowing where the author's from or, or knowing the story, you're drawn to the pictures. So I think that's one way that we can try to get our books taken on here, is just having the, uh, lovely illustrations like the ones you had with the fingerprints, beautiful, or something that is eye-catching and different, perhaps. And, yeah. and Shireen, what about yeah. what books? English books are everywhere in the Arab world, so you can start with with the, uh, with the information books, which are very popular, like the Oxford and the, and the Cambridge and the dictionaries, and the, um, and then you go to the reading series, like uh, uh, I don't know, um, uh, different even Oxford ones, Oxford Reading Tree, yeah, probably. and other yeah. ones. Um, so. So it's and Heinemann. This is what what I had in mind. Right. Um, so now with also Blue, Bloomsbury, Qatar, and the, you know the links and the Gruffalo in Arabic and all the most of the books from England translated into Arabic and and now uh, with the, even the Kitab in UAE in Abu Dhabi, they're funding translation into Arabic. So a lot of also books have been funded to be translated into Arabic, and a lot of them are from English because it's also an easy. It's a language that we know, we judge the book easily, and, and the English publishers are there. So it's, there are a lot of translations from English into Arabic, the Arab world. And of course, that's one thing we um, haven't really touched on, is the importance of translators. And, you know, it's obvious that if you've got access more easily to a language, it's easier to find the good books in it. So I'm sure there's work to be done in that area. I mean, I... I the French books we've translated, it's because I can read French and, and several people in my company can. And translators are so important in this conversation and the books they could help, I think, sometimes by putting forward books that um, 
they've read and enjoyed from other countries. But I suspect that children's books, yet again, are slightly at the bottom of the pecking order. Yeah, but I, I want to ask you something from your experience. Did you ever have a time to go around and look at books and browse them from other countries? No, never. If I went to a book fair, um, I the, well, I've made a list, I don't know if it would be interesting, of things that I think help with translation in my very limited experience. One is grants from cultural bodies um, to cover translation costs because translation costs are high and that is a big extra expense when you're buying in a book. Um, awards make a huge difference. The, the Marsh Award, which is still going, I hope, um, made such a big difference to us in trying to win it, actually. And we did win it for a translation. And that was a very proud moment for us. And it spurred us on enormously. Um, a rights team with many languages. And that is rare, but I think could be worked on. I think we could lobby in the house a bit more to have rights teams who are perhaps required to use their languages to read books from other countries and maybe tell us about them. That it doesn't happen at all at the moment. Um, Organisations, and maybe you would all be able to talk about this, were like your TEDA project, which promote um, books to other countries. We bought most of our books in because the French Institute is so proactive. Um, we meet with them regularly. They have a, a festival every autumn where they bring over lots of French writers. Um, and we got so many great books from those contacts. Um, and our fiction publisher has just been to f um, Antwerp and Ghent as a guest of the Flemish Literary Association. And she was taken round with publishers from France, Spain, Turkey, New Zealand, Germany, China, and Sweden to meet with industry professionals and to meet authors and artists and look at books. She's got her eye on quite a lot of Flemish books as a result now. Um, agents, relationships with agents, sometimes they will put a, a, a book even an adult agent might put a children's book your way, which they know from a country they're involved in. The same is true of publishers will put books our way. Um, translators, I've said how in important their enthusiasms can be. Um, authors, I, I, this book um, was done, it's a collection of poetry, very hard to sell, of nonsense verse from around the world. And the way that happened was the authors were prepared to find the poems, the um, ed anthologists who are poets themselves, and prepared to organize translations and work very hard to make all these poems available. Um, and then organizations like IBI we have here and Outside In who promote, well, literature from other countries within the UK. So I don't know if, if any of that sparks you. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of the things you're saying here are out of our control, like grants to, you know, from Arabic. Is, is, I, I don't know if there's something from Arabic, unless it's an international, like uh, South to South or something. Um, and a lot of things, business-wise, it needs money. To take a stand, to have a special person, you need really a good amount of money. And um, talking about the difference of uh, our countries are much cheaper than here. So having to, to do all of the effort and having a stand in London Book Fair and, and paying a lot of money. Uh, and, and there's a very small window. Wouldn't it be very maybe appealing to a publisher because you, the, the, the chance of succeeding is, I don't know, it's, it's very minimal. And, and would it cover the costs? This is a question mark. And wouldn't we put our effort maybe finding a new market in the Arab wor uh, uh, world, uh, doing another book? So this might feel more tempting and, and a bigger chance of succeeding. So I think being in a developing country and where you have a lot of chances to experiment and publish books and do things uh, would put the tra putting effort into translating to other languages as a second choice because you have a lot of things to do somewhere else and the chance to succeed is much more and, and maybe the return would be higher. And you've, I read about your company that um, your mission in a way was to make high quality originally Arabic books available to children. Is that because there were not so many before? 
when I, I, I did my master's in, in 2000, I finished it. So in 1999, I, had, um, I studied the, Lebanese, the, the, the children's books published in Lebanon, which were 3,363, something like that, books. And more than 45% of those books were translations. And the big percent, percentage of those were information books and, and stuff that are highly related to school, like you said. So I found out that there's a big gap to publish original Arabic children picture books that comes from the market. And you know, when you, go, when you travel abroad to the Arab world and you talk to the teachers or, or, or the customers, they tell you we want something that's from the culture because there are a lot of translations. So this is why we, we, we decided to concentrate there and find new talents and discuss the topics that are more related to the Arab world. Yes. Well, I, I think that was in a way a more urgent mission probably than worrying about getting the books translated. And maybe you will move to a phase when you want to get the rest of the world involved later. <laughs> exactly. And, and um, I don't know, Melike, perhaps, if you have anything to say about your market and what kind of books go down best in Turkey. It's school, really, isn't uh, it? The character value is the main theme. <laughs> uh, and uh, teachers and uh, parents prefer that kind of books. Uh, but in Turkey, there are different economical levels. And uh, most, uh, the big consumer is the middle level. And they prefer the, the uh, governmental schools. And they prefer especially Turkish writers' books. Yeah. Uh, but the high level, and uh, especially private schools, uh, they are just looking for the high qu quality uh, literary. Uh, so the main. Uh, translated books uh, consumes at that market. Mm. I think it's also true that fewer children's books are translated than adult books anyway. So, we're, uh, like you said, the ghetto within the ghetto. <laughs> and Susan mentioned something interesting in something she wrote about the idea that we have quite outdated notions of Eastern Europe mm. and South... And, and that, in a way, books could help us to move on from labels like East and West and Old Europe and New Europe. Mm. I don't know if you'd like to talk about that. Well, yeah, I think I wrote something in my website about uh, Eastern Europe conjuring up images of grey buildings and uh, pickled cabbage. So uh, <laughs> I did <laughs> want to obviously move away from that by having um, a range of interesting contemporary works and also works from perhaps older writers who'd been neglected, which um, didn't fall into those stereotypes, no. And uh, obviously, this book, uh, in fact, when you were talking about grants from uh, cultural institutes, this book was um, funded by a grant from the Serbian Ministry of Culture. And I think also for them, it was very nice to have a uh, such a lovely, pl a positive story coming out from somewhere like Serbia, where perhaps there wouldn't, you know, there might be memories of the war or uh, other kind of uh, images which are very negative. So. Um, they were very, very keen. In fact, the Ministry of Culture helped me in more than ways than one. They helped me get the rights. Um, and uh, other ministries of culture have also been very keen to help me. I have a, perhaps a Macedonian children's book, will be the next one online, and the ministry are already engaged. So they're very, very keen to, um, to get their literature out there onto the UK market because they really haven't been able to do it themselves. I know that the Macedonian uh, cultural ministry made a huge project to translate all the great works of Macedonian writers into English. So it was an enormous cost. And, um, but I just don't know if that's reached here at all, you know. <laughs> yeah, just, just a thought. I think I'm a bit, there's a disappointment somewhere. Because now I'm thinking about it. Uh, for example, in Abu Dhabi, the grant that they give is only if you sign the contra uh, a contract or, or like an intention of a contract in the book fair, and it doesn't specify it from which way to which way. But it's always going to the Arabic. So the people are there just to sell. They don't have interest. And the Sharjah book fair, there were so many English publishers there. and. <laughs> They, they really, they were everywhere invited by the sheikh and, and all the <laughs> prestigious things and the coffees and the dinners. And, and the only book that was translated, I think it was the only one into English, was, was the one that was done by the sheikh, which, which has a publishing house. And they had access to all the books from the Arab world. You know, the Sharjah book fair is one of the most important ones. So 
almost everybody was there, and the Arab books were there, and uh, you know, and they were there. <laughs> so <laughs> you feel that some at a certain point, uh, yeah, people are not open to translate picture books from other from other languages. You know, well, it, it goes back to what I was saying that we we were obviously busy selling, and we, yeah. <laughs> we weren't buying, and that's I'm not saying that's a good thing at all, but. Yeah, but uh, you know, you feel picture books are different. They, they're, they're different from one country to another. For example, if you see the books from Finland, they have more text. The stories are different and everything. But still, I think you have translated pictures book from Finland to English, wouldn't you? Wouldn't, wouldn't there be? The Moomins, I, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, why not us? You know, this they is, this <laughs> is like, okay, we're developing, we're da da da, but it's, it's, it's you know, the springtime, no, we're like, we're all the, through the media, so I think there's something to talk well, about. Well, I'm, I'm going to come away feeling we've really got to shape up here. <laughs> yeah. actually. But I mean, maybe before we should perhaps have questions as well, but I, I mean, it's, it's the rather hard thing, but is there a way you would characterize the, the, the children's literature of your country? Is that a all three of you, of what you know, Susan, is that a very difficult and silly question? Is there something that makes it special or makes it different? It is different. It is different. In the writing, in the... In every, for, in every way, the illustrations are different and the backgrounds. Are, there are s very similar things. It, when you talk about picture books for the younger children, there are certain things that are common. Uh, like, you know, the, uh, jealousy, love, uh, small action. You know, the, th the common themes that you can discuss. I think maybe it's different because our books maybe sometimes are 16 pages and not 32 pages and maybe the format and, and the way we do the text. But maybe there's a window. What's your um, take on things like the Arabian Nights? You know, your, your yeah, classic. They, they don't translate the Arabian Nights. I think they do it originally from with <laughs> with yeah. English authors or something. It's yeah, we do. You know, we do. I, I tell you, like Francis Lincoln then did the Mecca or the Ramadan books here, and they didn't translate it. So you know, you're just trying to do everything here. Yeah, <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> Uh, I want to give some uh, information about Turkey. Uh, Turkey in Turkey, children's literature is not uh, a, a department in, at the university. Uh, this is uh, very bad, uh, I think, very bad uh, conditions for the uh, for the uh, growth of the literature, uh, children's literature. And if if we can uh, say something to the uh, to the universities, please open children's literature. They say it's useless. Uh, the idea about the children's literature is that it's stupid something. Yes. I, I think this is the main problem for Turkey uh, to improve children's literature. If uh, tur in Turkey the literature, children's literature, uh, uh, the writer can write literary works, uh, I think that we can sell they to the market. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, they are really literary and they, they are really, uh, they are universal. Uh, and the main problem uh, is the academic problem in Turkey. So the idea of the writers, the idea of teachers, the idea of the parents. Uh, what is the literature for children? Yes, they, do, they, don't the they don't know the question. They don't know the answer of this question. What is yeah. the literature? What is the children books? What is the difference between them? They don't know. An idea. Very this is the big problem. Yeah. And Susan, do you have anything to add? I don't. I don't feel really qualified to say that I know enough about no. children's literature in the region, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't like to say how they differ. I like to look at the universality of the stories rather than the differences. That's the angle I come from. Can I? Yeah. I have just one more thing. If you look at the um, TV, for example, BBC, what's the percentage of children's programs that are translated into it? So. So you can you can have an idea of how much you for children. I, I think children in, in the UK is is a bit like there's an area that you have to protect. What are we giving it? So maybe let's think about maybe BBC and and how how many of the programs are translated into you know like Charlie and Lola and these kind of uh, yeah. children's programs. So a lot of it are, is a bit local. When you come to our part of the world, we watch TG, which is French. We watch uh, BBC programs. We have all of this. So we're more like, we're, we're open. Open, yeah. Well, we've raised a huge number of issues, I think, very quickly. Shall we now have questions and let you answer? Um, 
Uh, um, Antonia Lloyd-Jones, I'm a Polish translator. Um, I've got a question for Caroline. Given that the British market is highly competitive and very commercial on the whole and that all publishers need to make money, um, what are your criteria when you're choosing a foreign book? And this is a bit unfair, so don't, if you don't like this, but how would you, if you were presented with the books that we've been shown, how would you critique those and what would you be looking for in those books to publish? How do they compete with what's already being poured out on the British market in terms of drawings, quality of the translation, the actual story, and how it fits into your profile? Well, short answer is they would have to compete. They would have to be as good. They would have to work as stories. That's my main criteria, is that something's a good story. The art is obviously what sells with a picture book. I think you probably all know that. That's what people buy. But there's never a great picture book that doesn't have a great story. So it's a complicated process. But I would be judging it, I hope, in the same way as I would judge or I would look at books here. The problem is I would have all these language barriers to overcome in my ev evaluation. So mm. same old story. Uh, I would have a question about, you mentioned it, Susan, about illustrations. How much harder is it to sell a, a picture book uh, compared to maybe adult fiction? How, isn't it harder to, to translate pictures? And my experience is that a lot of buyers, publishers, and actually book buyers are more conservative when it comes to, to pictures than, than text. Because that can, that can be, it can be hard to convince someone. And you, you can, with one glance, you can say, these pictures don't work in our market and uh, maybe, yeah, what, what, what is your experience with that? Shall I answer first? Yes, um, it's quite interesting with this book actually because the, 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 region, the book came out in the 1950s and so since that time it's always had the same illustrations and for me those illustrations didn't work at all. They were very small, they were very scratchy, I just didn't think that they were appealing but of course in all those countries you can't separate the story from the pictures, yeah? So um, what I did was I uh, asked somebody to do new illustrations. This was a um, Croatian artist who did it for me. And what she did, I thought was very clever, is that she tried to include elements in her pictures which she thought of as very English. So <laughs> as you see here, the hedgehog, yes, I, exactly, exactly. He's sitting chair, in an armchair, <laughs> and then later on, he's drinking tea from a teapot, and all those things that she, and there she is, here he is, like yeah. looking at himself in a, in a little mirror on a dressing table. It's, she tried to include furniture, even, that she thought was very English. So <coughs> I thought that was a very, uh, very clever of her to even think about the future market, yeah. Um, so, I don't know, I think I probably, unless I really thought the pictures were so beautiful and integral to the text, I wouldn't necessarily take the pictures with the text. I might take on a new <coughs> illustrator. It would really depend. Do you have anything to say about artwork? Um, hello, my name is Cesar James. I'm a student from Germany, and I wanted to come back to uh, Caroline, how y it makes it easy for you to judge a book. Um, what pr materials uh, make it easier for you to um, m very quickly decide if the book will fit into your publishing line or not? Well, it is, it is really hard when it's translate, you know. A like to, to minimize the language barrier because that's like the mm -hmm. number one thing I'm picking up is like really making it hard. So yeah. how do you like... Um, kind of like minimize the language barrier with a picture book it would be very e it would be relatively easy to do a rough translation wouldn't it because it wouldn't be very long so i think if we're thinking of something where you you've published it and you've got what you think is stunning artwork just a, tr a rough translation would be fine would be really really helpful vis the hedgehog that would be fine with the novel i suppose we're reliant on that's why i was saying about getting rights teams with more languages, we would have to put the book out to a reader. Mm. But there are many ways of doing that. It's just much harder work. And I would say it's easier to be lazy in the end and <laughs> to do 
English books. We've got this stable of writers and artists that we're used to working with. We know them, it's comfortable. They're doing great books, I think. Mm. So it's terribly easy to go on. It's much, much harder to make the effort to, to scour the world and do this work. And I think we should much more. I, I feel very strongly that we should be doing it much more. But maybe we have to talk more and find out ways that uh, you know you could come into the office and show us your books or something and pitch them to us in a different way. Because I think going to book fairs and with a very busy rights team is really hard. I, I, I can see that's not going to happen. So we must find better ways of communicating. Does, sorry, does that answer your question a bit? Not very well. <laughs> Hi, my name's Judy Cumberbatch, and I'm a translator from Arabic as well as a children's writer. So um, this is a subject that really interests me. I'm, I'm interested, I've just been doing a rough translation of a book of mine to show to people over at um, Kalima. And it's that whole question of language. The, Picture book language, every word counts. And it, you know, it, you can get some which are very easy, the cat sat on a mat or something like that, but even there you've got the rhyme. So how prepared would you be for your books, I'm talking to all three of you really, for the language, I don't know, to be translated almost, to be adapted, to, to take on the nuances of the new languages that it's being put into? Do you, I mean, I... Onomatopoeia, all the sort of simple sounding words. You, you, do you see what I mean? How yeah. different and how similar does hard. it have to be? You know, it's very hard to put, a, to, to choose the simple wor uh, words to, to, to say the idea. So I think we have to have the special team. But I think okay. we are open to do a lot of changes, like the war book that we had to change all the illustrations to suit the European market, which is different than our kinds of illustration. So I think at our side, we're open, but it depends on the other side how much they are willing to consider. Okay. Open a small window. You'd be open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe I can say something about it, uh, because uh, we have nearly 1,000 books in our publishing house, and we bought many books from Germany, from uh, England, and from uh, French publishers, and uh, we adopted them uh, because of the religious uh, attitudes. And uh, the, maybe I can also something uh, from the other side, uh, how we can decide uh, which book is suitable for our market, because there are many books uh, in the market. Uh, in Bologna, there are a lot of books. So it is very difficult for us to decide which one is better for us. Uh, but uh, I have an idea that um, if, I allow, uh, if I allow to read a story, it, it gives me a pleasure. I believe that it also gives pleasure to my children and also to, to my market. Uh, because I think, I think it's a sense. Uh, to decide which one is is good, which one is uh, best for your market. Uh, but uh, I know that um, uh, I want to tell something about my German translation. Uh, my books, my Ravens, translated to German, and to, uh, German publishers asked me some questions, and I realized that they didn't understand what I mean in the story. And uh, I understand that the translator didn't understand what I mean. And they asked me, uh, can we change something uh, in the story? Yes, I said, you can do it, you can adapt to it. But it's necessary to change the Turkish ones because it is bilingual books. And they sent me Turkish changing. And I didn't imagine, I didn't understand what are they doing because they changed the story because they didn't understand. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't understand the voice because I believe that children's books is a, also a voice. It's also a poem. It's a poetry. Thank so, you. So. Uh, yeah. And Susan, do you have any sense about that question about voice and uh, like about how adaptable one should be with the translation and the language? Well, um, I translated this myself, so I speak now in my translator's voice, and um, it was because it was a rhyming poem. 
And in fact, this book was translated into Italian in about 2004. And uh, I saw that translation, but I, and then I was very disappointed with it because they hadn't kept the rhyme. And I thought that this story, one of the delightful things about it was that it had this rhyme, and children love rhyme. Yeah? And uh, so when I translated it, it took me a long time to do it. I was determined to do it only if I could keep that rhythm and the rhyme. And in order to do that, I had to change around some of the sentences and put one idea from one line down to the fourth line because otherwise it, I just couldn't get the rhyme right. And I felt perfectly at liberty to do that. Perhaps I was misjudging, I don't know. But I felt at liberty to do that because I thought that I got all the elements in somehow within the verse and the story was intact. I didn't change anything except, I should say this, at the end of the original story, it's rather brutal and all the other animals die. But <laughs> I didn't think that the English audience might be as prepared for that as perhaps a Balkan one, I don't know. And so I kind of <laughs> wrote it in a very kind of tactful way about them, you know, being no more and being chased by the hunter and things like that. So <laughs> you can note, I mean, if you realize that they probably were no more, but uh, I, didn't, I wasn't so brutal in it. And I, I mean, I felt, at liberty to do that, and Branko Chubic is dead, so <laughs> he can't say anything about it. <laughs> but I, I mean, people from the region who've read it have been very, very, very pleased because I think that the whole spirit of the story is intact and the rhythm and the rhyme. And that's what I would look for from other translations as well. I mean, I'm lucky in the fact, like you said, that I speak Serbokrat, whatever you want to call it, and so that I can judge the original. But if I couldn't, then I would ask somebody from the region who is a friend to give me their judgment of the translation. It's difficult when you're doing it from a language you don't know. Yeah. Yes, I think we've got another. Um, Rose Fenton from Free Word Centre. It was really, Caroline, in, in answer to your question, what are the ways in which we can learn about each other's literature? And I think it's something to do with hanging out together. I mean, we come to these fairs and it's all about business, selling, selling. And you actually had an answer in your list when you talked about the Flemish literary experience, where they invited a group of international publishers to hang out, probably for a few days, going to visit the literature houses and publishers in that part of the world, in that part of Europe. But during the course of those few days, the Turkish, the Lebanese, the British would then talk about their own work and ex exchange stories. And it's as simple as that, um, to try and get away from the kind of marketplace, but into kind of human relations and discussions. So, so we should thank the organizers of this seminar yes, for absolutely. <laughs> putting us all together. <laughs> yes. No more, is that it? Well, I guess uh, last my question. last question would be to Shireen. You earlier said it, it's easier to judge English books um, when you select them. And my question is, why is it easier for you to um, judge them easier? No, I, I mean, as a first impression, when you have a book in English, the text is there in English. But I, I've, I've translated so many books from German, so, so when there's a translation with a book, it's easier. But once the book is in English, you know, it's, you feel that you're very close to it because we are bi bilingual back home, so we, we study English like when we're two or, or we speak it all the time. So it's just a language that we use and we know it very well. So this is why it's easier to judge it. <laughs>